This territory is known as the Badlands. It belongs to three Sioux tribes in North Dakota. After the discovery of a huge shale oil reserve here in 2008, the tribes have become rich to the tune of millions of dollars. The Fort Berthold Indian Reservation was the epicenter of a miraculous oil discovery. But 15 years after the first drillings, it's become a place of stagnation. Jeff White is a security guard for the MHA police. Uh, back in 2014, we created um, MHA Drug Enforcement, kind of a standalone law enforcement agency within the tribe to, uh, to just concentrate on uh, combating drugs. MHA is the acronym for Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara, the three tribes that have sovereignty over the reservation, who are now embroiled in the aftermath of the oil boom. You got a gun in the car? Yeah. He's a gun dog. Oh, is he? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Firearms in the United States falls under the Second Amendment, which allows all its citizens to uh, own firearms. So he's legal. The boom is over, but the, uh, the wells are still producing. So, and people are still getting uh, oil royalties and you know, sad to say, some of that gets used on, on the drugs. If you look at the reservation population-wise, it looks like it's a, a huge, huge thing. For us, it is, um, but statewide, too. Newtown, one of the reserve's main towns, consists of a single main road. Here, the pickups are as ubiquitous as the boredom. The oil workers have left their mobile homes to drill for oil elsewhere. The ramshackle homes of the new moguls of this providential oil rush raise questions. She wants a fried bread burger. Cheeseburger, hamburger. Cheeseburger. Cheeseburger. With onion and mustard. Right. Brandy Canyon is an employee at TDH, the only fast food restaurant in town. Right out here. For Brandy, a native of the reservation, the Sioux oil revenge has left a bitter taste. A lot of people think that people from our tribe here have land and oil, no, it's less than 13% versus, you know, 13% of 17,000 is what, less than 2,000. So less than 2,000 people get major oil royalties versus the majority of us out here that don't have land or minerals. All of us enrolled members, we are all collectively owners of the tribal land, but how and that is said and spent and whatnot, we don't really get as much say, which would be nice, especially on major purchases our tribe makes. The MHA manages the reservation and the dividends that come from oil. It receives $25 million a month in oil revenues and invests them. Useless and empty administrative and cultural buildings 
bearing its effigy, have sprung from the ground just like oil. Come on, show me around. I haven't been in it for five months, four months, four months. Get rid of all the construction dust. Yeah, nice and warm in here. Mark Fox, MHA president, elected by the community, is delighted to show visitors around his innovative and futuristic giant greenhouse in the making. Can't wait for my strawberries and the green yeah. peppers. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be so amazing. We've taken our energy, re revenue, and resources and using them to spin off another business, right? Agriculture, bring it back. So we're pretty excited about it all. You know, millions of pounds of, of food and, and that's gonna be produced all year long. To implement his project, the Sioux chief turned agricultural engineer proudly explains how the waste gas from the flares will be used to heat his huge orchard. For, for thousands of years, we had corn, beans, squash, watermelon, and we grew them massively. So over time, we became dependent on, you know, commodities and, and modernized food. But now, the objective is not only to bring that back, to eat healthy here, grow our food all year long, but to become a leading exporter of agriculture in the United States and the world. And, and I'll be honest with you, it isn't just us or myself and we here at MHA Nation that are excited about the project. There's a lot of other people excited about it in the state, the governor, everybody else. Everybody's watching. The cost of the vegetable garden is $26 million, but there are no plans to build a hospital. Like all Newtown Native Americans, Benjamin Goodbird and his friend Kelly Hosey have to travel 700 kilometers to get to a health clinic. They are at a complete loss when it comes to the MHA and its president's investments. It cost $1.9 million. I don't even think this went out last year. I think it did for like oh. three times. Every time they pull it off the water, it costs a couple thousand, maybe more than that. There's our yacht. There she is, island girl. <laughs> the tribal council's lavish spending, far removed from the day-to-day -day concerns of its honorary members, is causing quite a stir. MHA officials dream of boosting employment and would like to develop tourism here. The result is a yacht stationed at the foot of their casino, and the river is iced over six months of the year. It, it's a loss of money, I think, or it's a loss. It's not, uh, it's not worth it. They never use it. They had to build a special dock, but I was like, that's still our money, you know, trying yeah. to tell the people that's still the tribe's money. But the most chilling of all is this artificial lake, which has swallowed up much Native American history and which MHA members want to turn into a playground. The name of it is Lake Sakakawea. And it, it originally was the bottomlands and the home of the, the Mandan Hadatsa Rikirau people. We lived here uh, on this, where the, underneath where the lake is, and so our homes were here. So uh, all of our different little bands and societies and uh, clans, we all lived here. and. Uh, what year was that that they flooded this? Uh, it was like in the 40s, maybe. 1940? Yeah, maybe. You know, uh, they just uh, built a dam way down there called... Uh, yeah, right. On the other side, yeah. They start building it and just start letting the water come in slowly. In 1947, 
the US federal government forced the tribes to give up their land to build the Garrison Dam. They were relocated on each side of the river in the aptly named New Town. The wound is still raw for many here, who see their own clan's plan for a tourism project on this sacred land as an affront. Our home get destroyed. And to think like a long time ago, it was the white people doing that to us. And now we have to watch our own people like do it to us now. This reservation belongs to the people. And the people should have a say, not just seven people. Yeah, seven. Yeah. It should be uh, the whole people. They should, each segment should have a meeting. What do you guys think? You know, talk. The resentment of the Native Americans left behind in what has been dubbed the little Saudi Arabia of North America is palpable even at the slot machines in the Newtown Casino, also owned by the MHA. I get upset because um, we gave up a lot. Our people gave up a lot when they moved us out of the bottom because of the dam they had to build over here. We gave up 159,000 acres of land. And that's a lot. We were separated. People live across. We're scattered. Our families don't get to see each other like they should. When they put the casino here, it was kind of a good thing because it drew people to work. Plus, a lot of people like the idea, you know, that they get to see others. It's kind of a thing for people to come to in a way, I mean, to like to get out of the house, for instance. Joanne Matthews has never left the reserve. It wasn't so much the new house she's been living in since her camp was submerged that she wanted to show us, but rather her noisy neighbors. The first thing you say, oh my gosh, they're drilling over there next. And because, for the simple reason, you can hear them at night and the ground sort of shakes a little bit. And even when you're lying in bed, you feel a tremble like, uh, you would say, what are they doing? You know, you hear it. <sighs> Sometimes you smell that. And it's not good. It's not good. Our reservation looks like a birthday cake at night, all lit up. Yeah, that's the way it is. <gasps> that's the way it is has become a mantra for the resigned Native Americans of the Fort Berthold Reservation. But the bitterness, fueled by the disastrous consequences of the oil boom, goes beyond the borders of Sioux territory. White farmers raising cattle on this land are affected too. Twice a year, most of them gather in Dickinson to sell their cattle. Donald Nelson is one such farmer. You see a ripping good kind here, guys. Be the Donnie Nelson cattle. Every one of them are 100% home-raised cattle running off the Donnie Nelson Ranch. I'll tell you what, and when he feeds them guys, he just feeds them just perfect. The Nelson family have been breeders for three generations. Donald and his wife, Rena, who own a herd of 400, don't make the majority of their income from cattle sales. Six and a half. So, 206 and a quarter. 
we did better than we thought we were going to do. So, because the market's so up and down. She can buy a new pair of shoes. Yeah, but that's it. Buy a new pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Donald and Rena have given in to the lure of petrodollars. They rent several of their plots to oil companies, have had their house renovated, and employ two farm workers. But they won't talk about the income they receive. It's a conflicting deal. It comes with the good and the bad, you know, so the good part was we financially, the state is beyond our dreams. In fact, they don't know how to handle it, I don't think. And of course, it made a lot of money for people. It brought jobs and younger people back in. We were kind of an older <laughs> society here. I was, I was considered a young farmer and I was 40 some years old, you know, so. Boom part, I guess you'd say, is over. It's producing, but it's starting to decline. I don't like the way it's worded. I don't want to sit here like we have with some I can show you that are still here, never reclaimed, you know, and you don't get nothing for them. And you can't use the land. I don't want to see that. I think I'll take you back to one over there and we'll do it there. It was kind of the, it's on ours, so that's one good thing. If somebody comes, I don't have to worry. That's not our land, so. On Donald's land, as in the nearby Sioux Reservation, oil and gas extraction has been made possible by fracking. A modern process that involves injecting a pressurized liquid into the rock and piercing the densest substrates. This oil is then mixed with salt water containing arsenic and other toxic substances. Noxious waste stored in huge tanks is another source of concern for Donald. Problem is, as I always say, it's a man and a machine. One of them's gonna mess up sooner or later. And you have to do something with that salt water. It used to be they put it in pits or they, you know, when you pipe it, you have pipeline leaks. And, and so once you have that spill, and then once they're up, you have to deal with them too. But the oil companies prefer to sweep the incidents under the carpet and are reluctant to clean up the contaminated and depopulated plains of North Dakota. The estimated cost is $2 billion. If you don't have the power to combat them, really, um, they have the best lawyers and they, they have the most money and they know how to drag it out, you know. The state should be liable is what we say because they have allowed it. It's a takings. The irony is that white farmers and the Sioux are now fighting alongside one another. Both are speaking out to criticize the way the federal and tribal authorities alike are managing the oil money. In Newtown, Kelly Hosey and her five children live in a three-bedroom house and would like to benefit more in their daily lives from the 300 million a year in oil revenues. We get $1,000 three times a year from the royalties that we, that from the oil revenue. I mean, just with, just with the $94 million that uh, land that they bought, just the one land, they could have did five more payments of $1,000 for their people. That's 8,000 a year even, you know? And those shoes, those are dumb. <laughs> the latest expenditure by the managers is not going down well. Five hectares of land in Las Vegas for $90 million. President Mark Fox, who was re-elected in 2022 for a third term and who excels in self-congratulation, sees the investment as preparation for the future of the Klan. Eventually, the oil and gas will run out. Eventually, that will be gone. I have to strategize how to reinvest, make more baskets, more eggs and more baskets, right? But while it has value now, we're going to take that, we're going to utilize that, and we're going to build out and enhance 
our overall economic development and our sustainability as a nation. All these different things that we've created um, cost us a lot of money, but it was well spent. And yeah, we're criticized for not always having the numbers out there all the time. That's fine. Uh, most people that are busy with life and see for their own eyes what we've done say, amazing. If you watch it. On the day this interview was recorded, the SPJ, a consortium of American journalists, awarded the Black Hole Award to the president of the MHA for his opaque and haphazard management of oil revenues. This is little consolation for the Native Americans of the reservation, whose anger is being ignored so soon after uniting. It says the Society of Professional J Journalism has given North Dakota three affiliate tribe Mark Fox its on in inevitable Black Hole Award. It's a Du Bois Honor Award annually to highlight the most heinous violations of public rights to known, according to the New York Times. If we didn't have this oil and stuff, Mark wouldn't be in here. That means a man that don't have, he's thinking about himself and, and not even thinking about the people. My, that's his thinking is thinking like a white man. He's thinking like a white man with no teachings from his, from our culture, from our ways. Three hundred and eighty-six thousand barrels are extracted every day from the thirteen hundred wells still operating in the Fort Berthold Reservation, accounting for one quarter of U.S. oil production. boys come on there this guy's name is chinksy in uh in the sioux language that's sun we never had all this traffic this traffic is just uh too much right now it's just cars going back and forth mostly trucks I know I can't do nothing about it, you know, and I just have to live with it. <laughs> you know, I can't. There's no way they're, they're ever gonna move them out of there. So uh, we uh, ride around them, and we got our own trails back there once we hit the river. You see all the oil field and all the fences. It's, it makes you feel bad because how it was. The Sioux of North Dakota are having a hard time rejoicing over their reservation being elevated to the status of the first Native American refinery in American history. And the pace is set to continue. According to experts, the subsoil still holds enough hydrocarbons to keep the balance wheels turning for the next 20 years. <laughs> 